Need us thinking of resistance training first as body armor, it's protection. My grandmother, she was 83, she fell, she didn't have that body armor she needed, went into surgery, and she was just under the needle way too long because as they were trying to reattach certain things, she didn't have that structure that she could have had. We need that as protection and understanding that. That's one. Two, it's going to increase your metabolism if we do it the right way. I just think the level of weight training and our perception of what that needs to look like are completely different. Don Saladino has coached actors, athletes, and musicians for over 20 years and is known for helping people transform their bodies in short periods of time. He's worked with Ryan Reynolds, Blake Lively, Jake Gyllenhaal, John Krasinski, Emily Blunt, Liev Schreiber, Sebastian Stan, Anne Hathaway, Zachary Levy, Hugh Jackman, and the list goes on. And apparently before the call, I found out he worked with Wally Zerbiak, who I played basketball against, and he became uh, an, inc an incredible player, way, way better than me. Um, and he's had the honor of gracing the cover of the iconic Muscle and Fitness magazine. So Don, such a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Jason. It's like to be on, man. This is great. So you're the guy, like you're the go-to guy. If, if I'm an actor or an athlete and someone says, hey, you got to transform your body, you need to put on a lot of lean muscle mass or, or lose fat or ultimately usually a combination of both, like you are that guy they go to. So walk us through, how did you become that go-to guy? It was interesting. Um, first off, thank you. Uh, appreciate the compliment. Uh, you know, it was probably my love and passion for fitness at a really young age. I went off to play college baseball. You know, had dreams of trying to move on from there. And when that didn't work out for me, um, I was so connected to fitness. I really felt like I was minoring in nutrition and weightlifting when I was in college. It was just even my my coach was like do the program you want to do. He was always, he just knew where, where my head was when it came to research and I was in a good place. So when I graduated college, I went and I worked at a big box gym for a year, cleaned up weights, did the things I needed to do back in 1999. I um, then in 2000 broke off, opened my own one-on-one -on -one training business, started doing pretty well, actually. Uh, as a young guy, you're making about I was making about 200,000 bucks a year. I thought that was a lot of money. I was really excited about that. And then realized that my entrepreneurial juices um, was kind of, demanding more out of me. So I went in and I did my first fundraise in about 2003, raised about $5 million. And I opened my first club in 2005, which we held on to till the lease expired um, in May of 2020, right around COVID, uh, right in the middle of COVID. And in that span of time, you know, launched digital companies, exited from there, um, had massive successes, massive failures. And, you know, through that process, we were working a lot with professional golfers because, of my strength and conditioning background. My brother was a professional golfer. He was down in the mini tours for a while. And this was right around the time where Tylus just launched their, their golf fitness program. We went through all the training. We were the first level threes to graduate from there. And um, we were working on my brother and he just went from not hitting it long to hitting it long and being more resilient and getting in this great golf shape. So we had this passion for golf fitness. We were doing kinematic sequencing, 3D swing analysis, and our club be became about golf fitness. We were assessing, you know, people's mechanic, individuals' mechanics downstairs. We were then assessing how they swung upstairs, and we had the pro, the golf fitness instructor, myself and my brother sitting and working on these people to get them to move as efficiently as possible. And that was really successful for us up until about 2007, 2008, when Lehman Brothers crashed and Bear Stearns crashed, and you know, we were just doing so well when it came down to corporate spending because we had these indoor simulators. We were doing corporate entertaining parties, bachelor parties, whatever it was, um, team building events. And that kind of got thrown out the window. And right around that time is when I met an actor by the name of Hugh Jackman. And Hugh, um, you know, basically said, I got to get ready for a movie called Wolverine in Australia. And he saw me train at my gym. He was there with a friend of mine and asked me to work with him. And I said, no, I'm not working with you. You work with my friend. He's like, no, 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 you don't understand. And I'm like, no, 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 I understand. Like, I'm not working with you. Like, it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then my buddy, who uh, his name's Rico, great coach, by the way, he was moving. And I was just assuming that he, he, was, he was moving. He, he, had, uh, he was having triplets and they had to move out of the city. So I then started working with Hugh and really had a passion for this performance physique world because I had the strength and conditioning background. Fantastic. Like I knew what it, I knew what had to go into allowing the human body to move. Um, I knew what had to, I knew the difference between flexibility and mobility and stability and all these things that these terms that people use so loosely. And I understood how to create a better athlete. So 
coupling that with the fact that I, I was on my first cover back in, I think, 2002, 2003. So I always understood nutrition. It was a passion of mine. I always had friends that were bodybuilders. I grew up training at Bev Francis Powerhouse Gym. So you're in there with bodybuilders like Dorian Yates and Frank Seppi and getting close with guys like Michael Hearn when he'd be in town and, and all this stuff, all having all these influences on you. So living in the worlds of performance and physique was really an interesting combination because so many strength and conditioning coaches live in one area or bodybuilding coaches living in another area, but to kind of merge them together was something that is challenging and tricky and to, to do it naturally, that's a completely different story. So worked with Hugh, there was no social media then. Um, he was trying to do marketing for me. I didn't even want him to because I was so infatuated with this, he got this idea of protecting the celebrity. I didn't want to expose them. They were in there for a job. My job was to get them from point A to point B. And we developed an amazing relationship for about a year. And um, you know, he ended up moving. But at that point when he moved, uh, he kind of opened the floodgates for me and introduced me to um, Scarlett Johansson. And I started working with ScarJo for a while. And um, then I met Ryan Reynolds. And then at that point, uh, it's just every single week there'd be different people in there. You turn around, The Rock's training in there. You turn around, Sandra Bullock's training in there. Jennifer Aniston's walking in. It became the place where people came to for this high quality product. We ran a mentorship program out of there. We trained all of our coaches. We had nutritionists on site. Um, we had functional medicine doctors you'd have access to. I could turn an MRI around in two to three hours. You know, people would come with injuries. I called Josh, Josh Dines at HSS. People would be up there. By the time they'd be in the Uber ride leaving, we would be um, assessing, or the cab ride, we, we'd be assessing um, you know, their, um, their, their issues going on. So I, I really felt like I became this ultimate connector. But um, golf fitness is still something I'm involved with. I'm the head golf fitness instructor for Golf Channel, which is kind of funny. And um, on the other hand, I'm on the Men's Health Advisory Board and I shoot with muscle and fitness almost every day. So it really was, looking back on it now, it's not the smartest thing to do. I mean, you want to take your niche and your category and run with it. But I just wore a couple different hats and not to toot my own horn, like I was, I'm pretty good at both of them. So it's just something that I embraced and continue to get better at it. But ironically, with all that said and done, it's like, my, my biggest market is the female market. I mean, I probably, like I said earlier, about 70% of my online clients, they're women. And um, I think it's because of this community I've developed. I think it's because of my ability to talk to people and really kind of dive into their psyche and understand, you know, what is it? Why? You know, why is it that they're unable to be successful? What are the things going on in their life? Rather than just saying, here's the program, do it, be disciplined. And um, let's keep resetting that New Year's resolution every year that they've just been unsuccessful with. So it's been great. It's been a great run so far. About 25 years I'm going on now. Well, whatever you're doing, keep on doing it. And you, know, you mentioned 70% of your, your clients are women. I would say probably similar numbers to our, our audience. And I would say it's probably safe to assume that most of our listeners aren't necessarily looking to become Wolverine and, and transform their bodies like Hugh Jackman, although maybe some are. But I think, you know, an exciting shift in the the well-being conversation is around longevity. And the science is pretty clear. If you're focused on longevity, you need to be focused on lean muscle mass. And, you know, yoga, Pilates, fantastic practices. If you like doing them, keep on doing them. But if you're if you're really serious about lean muscle mass, you, you need some strength training. And you're also going to need cardio. And in, in terms of, you know, setting the stage for everyone at the highest level, if I'm listening, I'm fit, I'm active, but I want to, you know, build or maintain my lean muscle mass, male or female, probably want to lose excess fat. I think everyone would say if hey, there's excess fat to lose, I would probably want to lose it. So if I want to maintain or build lean muscle mass, lose excess fat, I want to, I want to be fit. I want to feel good. I probably don't have a lot of time. How should, how should one, we'll start here. How should one think about strength training and cardio and how should we divide our time if we're, if we're looking at, you know, our time is a hundred percent. Should it be, you know, 50 strength training, 50% strength training, 50% cardio. I'll pause there. Like, how do you think about the highest level? How should we divide our time? 
I know what you're getting at. And the first thing I want to do is I don't want to discourage people by hearing mass. Like they originally hear the word mass. Women hear that and they're they're ready to click click this thing off. Oh, no, I don't want to put mass on. I don't want to put size on. It is so difficult. It's so challenging to put on muscle. Now, just because someone puts on muscle doesn't mean they're going to get bigger. Um, and by the way, I've worked with all shapes and sizes. I have a woman right now that's lost over 500 pounds. She started with me at 872 pounds. Yep, not too many people on the planet that you could say. And, we, and this is a process, seven years, reteaching her how to walk, dealing with her doctors. Now we have to get probably 50 to 70 pounds of skin removed. On the other hand, I have a woman that won my challenge last year that gained over a kilo of weight. She's, she's foreign. And well, why would she win a challenge if he lost it? Well, she – because she lost eight pounds of fat, because according to her DEXA, and she and she gained about nine, a little over nine pounds of muscle. So you know, a little over that. So a kilo is two point two pounds. So technically, putting on weight, you know, you would say most women are like, oh, I don't want to do that. When you look at pictures of her body, she looks amazing in a bikini. Her entire mindset changed, and that's what we need to think about. We think about putting on muscle as getting well done. I don't want to look like you. I'm like, okay, I understand that. Thanks. <laughs> right. It's like, I'm not saying that you do, but the approach that most women are taking to changing body composition, I'm sorry, it's wrong. Like they're, they're just getting on there and doing cardio. They think by spinning their wheels on the elliptical that this is going to increase their metabolism. I and mean, yes, there is a component to that where you are going to be improving cardio, cardio respiratory endurance. It's healthy for your heart. But if we could focus on trying to Put muscle on. And when I say that, you put a pound of muscle on, you lose a pound of fat, you're the same weight. A pound is a pound. It's, a, it's, it's no different. And you know, I think the main goal here is we want to set the stage and say, what is, the, what, are, what is everyone listening to this? What do they want to achieve? They want to look better naked. They want to wake up with optimal levels of energy. They want to feel great. They want to move great. They want to sleep better, right? I mean, if we could check all those boxes and if every person who's listening to this can wake up, look at themselves naked in the mirror and go, yes. That is the goal. Now, if that meant that they were gaining two pounds, how many people are going to say yes to that? Immediately, they're like, oh, I don't want to gain weight. I'm like, no, 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 relax. So just setting the stage there. Now, those things that you mentioned like yoga and Pilates, they're fantastic. We were talking about Tara Styles earlier. Tara, Tara, I remember her and I having a conversation 10 years ago when we were both with Cosmo Body. And she's like, well, you get stronger when doing yoga. And I was like, of course you do. You are going to get stronger. You are going to de develop flexibility. You are going to develop stability, which equals mobility. The combination of flexibility, stability equals mobility. I said, but, you know, Pilates, yoga, they're great for getting you stronger, more mobile, but they aren't optimal for putting on muscle. It's not. It's a fact. It's a scientific fact. If you want to put on muscle more efficiently, you're going to do some form of resistance training. Now, whether that's with a dumbbell, a barbell, a band, a kettlebell, I don't care. It's like create tension. You know, do this with a high level of movement quality. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if we have muscle on our body, we're going to raise our BMR, which is our basal metabolic rate, our resting rate at which we burn calories. And that should be the goal, right? Like if, if, if I'm talking to a female right now and she burns 1,400 calories a day and we can get her metabolism up to where she's burning 1,700 at rest, well, that's just better. Right. But most of us are living in this deficit where we're trying to restrict calories, which promotes weakness, which promotes less steps, lower levels of energy, poor sleep, sleep quality, a reduction in mood. All these negative things happen out of going into that calorie deficit. So I think it's really first understanding what type of training are we doing and why? Right. Like, why are we doing what we are doing? And if you're someone who's like, listen, I want to do Pilates. I hate resistance training. And this is all I want to do. And this is what I love. Then great. I'm not going to talk you off the, I'm not going to talk you away from doing that. Right. Um, would I still prefer you to get one or two days of resistance training in there? Do I think that would help? Yes. But the fact that we're moving and we're doing what, you know, and we're doing that with a level of resistance, I do believe. Um, has a high level of benefit to it. So um, I kind of just wanted to set the stage there. And I don't know if I actually answered your question. I absolutely agree. I always say the best exercise is the one you actually do. And, and if you like something, you'll do it. If you love Pilates, do Pilates. But with, with all that said, if someone is serious about, you know, they're, they're, they're looking in the mirror and, and they're, they're concerned, they don't have enough muscle and they're thinking about longevity. Like for, for me at age, you know, by the time this airs, I'll be 48. 
uh, I think about strength training in a whole different way. When I played basketball competitively in college, it was about power and speed and quickness and weight and reps. And now at 48, I think of how do I maintain, maybe build a little bit. It's harder for me. The older you get, more difficult to build. So maybe I'm building a little bit, but maintaining building muscle mass for longevity. I want to make sure my body's strong. I want to make sure that, you know, God forbid I, f- I fall at some point, I'm going to be okay. Or I get into an accident or I'm, I'm, I'm more durable because Body the statistics, armor. yeah, the statistics are terrible. If, if you, if you fall, I think after age 65 and break your hip, like the, your, the, 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 your, your chances of, of, of dying within five years go through the roof. It's insane. Yeah. So like, yeah. I think about the context, I want to be strong. Happened to my grandmother. She was 83. She fell. She didn't have that body armor she needed. Went into surgery and she was just under the needle way too long because as they were trying to reattach certain things, it just wasn't, she didn't have that structure that she could have had. So yeah, I, I need us thinking of resistance training first as body armor. It's protection. Like that's why athletes try and get, you know, a level of, of a mass on them, whether they're male or female. It's like, we need that as protection and understanding that that's one, two, it's going to increase your metabolism. If we do it the right way, oh, well, it's going to increase your metabolism. I just think the level of weight training and our perception of what that needs to look like are completely different. Crossfitters come in and they're, you know, not against CrossFit. It's like anything else. Someone asked, what do you think of CrossFit? I'm like, well, that's a weird question. What do I think of going to restaurants? There's good restaurants. There's bad restaurants. There's good. I know coaches that are smart that structure their cross training, CrossFit a certain way. And there's places that are just ludicrous. It just makes absolutely no sense. So, you know, I, I think at a very bare minimum, if someone was able to get in there to start two to three days a week, I'm not saying what's optimal. I'm saying the bare minimum two to three days a week at 20 to 30 minutes. That's and is that, now, is that just resistance training or is that cardio as well? How do you no, think about that, that relationship? I would say 23 minutes, that would be about resistance training. Cardio, we really don't need to beat the crap out of cardio. Now, I love cardio. Like I just swam across the, I, I just swam, uh, I just did the GI Joe, um, GI Go Fund where I had to swim from Jersey around the Statue of Liberty up past Ellis Island, up the Hudson. Um, so I was in the Hudson for over three miles and I was Ooh. great. I mean, great. It reminds, it, it reminds me of I, I, I'm a Seinfeld fan, and when Kramer sw- swam in the Hudson River, it was. It was <laughs> and I just I just raced up the Empire State Building to raise money for cancer. Like that was my fourth or fifth time. I love doing cardio. It allows me to feel good, and it honestly, you know, gives me this level of heart health and um, a, a good feeling. It helps with my rest, my readiness, my recovery, but. You know, cardio to, as as a primary focus to drop body fat. No, no, it's it's not, it, it, it's not right. It's it should be the side dish. Resistance training should be the entree. Though a lot of people do that the other way around. Now, if your main focus for sport is cardiovascular, if you're an ultra runner, or if you're a marathon, or if you're something that that is my job or my sport. I understand how the training, but for general pop. It's completely incorrect. And my my take on cardio is, you know, if you're, you know, a lot of people are talking about zone two training, you know, to, to have some level of cardiovascular fitness as you age. And what I say is, you know, you don't need to go nuts here. Just take the stairs. You know, I have a rule. If, you, if it's less than five flights, take the stairs, go quick. Once a week, what I'll do now in the building we live in in Miami, it goes 22 flights. I'll go up all 22 once a week. Go, if you're going for, if you like, if you like jogging, go jog. If you don't, don't. If you're walking, pick up the pace. Like it's it's that it's that simple. So we'll, 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 we've established that. We'll put cardio to the side. So let's bring it back to, to resistance training. So you're saying, at the minimum, two to three days a week, twenty to thirty minutes, and that just so so now we're there. And then there's a whole there's so much to say about this one. You know that you know what days of the week, what are the rest days? Are we doing the whole body? Are we doing? Are we splitting up by body parts? Uh, are we focused on weight? Are we focused on reps? So lots of lots to unpack there. So let, let's start there. I've got three days. In in a perfect world, two to three days. What are those days? I think they're full body workouts because we're getting more frequency type of uh, frequency style of training now. Um, you know, you look at the old bodybuilder mentality of uh, doing one body part here and there. You're just you would have to hit so much volume to even accumulate this level of hypertrophy that you're probably going to be incredibly sore. Um, I like the idea of bringing people in and frequently 
practicing and hitting these patterns over and over. I think it's great for athletic development. I think it's great for your cardiovascular system because we're throwing in big bang for our buck movements. I think we could focus primarily on big bang for our buck movements, get in and get out. And I think full body workouts for those two to three days a week are great. As for days of doing it, I would recommend a day rest in between, a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. But listen, it's you got to do what's enabling you to be successful. If someone right now is turning around, I just got off the call with a friend and they said, oh my God, schedule's really tough right now, right? The typical thing. Everyone's so busy that they can't get this in. I said, well, listen, how are you on weekends? And they're like, I'm great on weekends. I said, great. So that's two days. Saturday, Sunday, you're going to start training Saturday and Sunday if it's that bad. So now we got to find another day or two, another, you know, however many. He's on a four-day plan. Um, you got to find another two days during the week. Can you do that? And he goes, absolutely. The two days I don't have my kids. My kids are with my, my ex-wife. I said, great. I said, so that's it. We just, we, we just solved that issue. Now, if the workouts are back-to-back, biggest misconception in fitness. I get such a kick out of this. I normally hear this from bodybuilders. Oh, well, you can't train, you know, muscle groups back-to-back days. Wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Of course you can. It's about volume. It's about frequency. It's about intensity. I'm sorry. It's about volume. It's about intensity. We could frequently train a muscle group back to back days if we are not accumulating so much volume. So let me give you an example. Let's look at an old traditional bodybuilding program. Chest on Mondays, right? They always make fun of that. Chest on Mondays. Let's say a bodybuilder goes in and does 20 sets for their chest workout on Monday, right? Well, that could be five exercises, four sets apiece. Or I could turn around and take those five exercises and do one on Monday, one on Tuesday, one on Wednesday, one on Thursday, one on Friday. We have five exercises spread out on five days at four sets. We're still accumulating 20 sets. We're still accumulating that level of volume. We'll probably be less sore. I could probably change up the angle at, at which we are hitting it at, meaning how we're loading the joint. So if we're going at an incline press, a flat press, a push up a decline, a fly, different angles of a fly. There's so many things that we can do differently to involve the chest, but not overwork that one area. Now, if you're going to turn around and do 20 sets of chest on Saturday and then come back 20 sets of chest on Sunday at a certain period of time, there's a cost to doing business. I don't know how you're recovering. I don't know how your joints are going to feel. I don't know if you're going to start getting weaker, if resting heart rate is going to start elevating in the morning because now readiness isn't there because your body is so fatigued and so taxed and can't recover. So, you know, I, I don't think, I think just keeping it as simple as possible, two to three full bodies a week, try and keep a day in between. And you know what? If life gets the best of you and you got to double up back to back days because we're not coming in and hitting with high volume you can hit it back to back days. It's fine. But I'm just saying from an optimal standpoint, that's how I, I love it. And when you bring up the every, the everyday thing and the bodybuilding, you know, misconception about this, I, I remember it brings me back. We both grew up on Long Island and in the early nineties, I used to go to this gym called ultimate gym in Glen Cove. And it was like the whole shtick. And like, I remember, I don't know why I remember this, but I do doing like the full body. And there was like a, you know, guy who was very a very amateur wannabe bodybuilder he was like you gotta do the full body you know you're not doing it all wrong you're doing the full body you gotta do this and this and i had and then i would get the gloves and the whole thing and I, I swear i would go with my friends and i was like in ninth or tenth grade and i basically like got a little stronger but like it was just like going sideways then when i got to college and started doing weightlifting in a proper way it's like holy shit i'm getting stronger i've, I've trained over i've trained over forty thousand one hour sessions in my life Forty thousand. That's 25 years of training. That's a lot of, I've taken hundreds and hundreds of courses. I have created thousands of programs, thousands. And I have templates on thousands of them, literally in my, uh, in, in my, in my file. I cannot tell you how many different types of programs I have created from full bodies every day to body parts, to muscle groups twice a week, three times a week, upper push, upper pull, lower body, isometric workouts, um, clusters, drop sets, running the rack, you know, frequency style. I mean, I can go on and on. Kettlebell programs. I got my first kettlebell cert uh, certification back in 08, 09. It all works. 
all this stuff works. Like there was never a program that I turned around and I was like, oh my God, there's, there's, a, there's a method of training I like leaning more towards, which is more of a power building type of approach because I love being strong on my compound lifts. And then I love hypertrophy work, but I am doing mobility work every day. Like I took my daughter and her best friend to Smashing Pumpkins and Jane's Addiction last night at the garden. 15 minutes before I got into the shower, I went through a mobility circuit, all movement, you know, just allowing my body to unwind, allowing my body to feel good. You know, I play ice hockey a couple of days a week. I'm on the golf course a lot. Um, I swim across the Hudson. I, I, I like wearing a lot of hats. And part of that is allowing my body to have this level of resiliency to where I can bounce back. I need to be cover ready all year long. Two, I always say I got to be two weeks out. When I talk to Ryan Reynolds, two weeks out from a cover sheet if we ever needed it. So we can turn things around, tweak some things in dieting. Training really doesn't change up much, but the dieting changes uh, happen a little bit and we're going to be ready in, you know, whatever it is. I say two weeks, two, three, four weeks. So all these programs work. The fact that we're out there looking for this magic template where programs go wrong though is when, and you hear it, oh my God, I love the sense of community. Oh my God, my mind, I'm sweating. I feel great. Well, how's your body feeling? Well, Don, it's funny that you bring that up. The hip's been sore. I said, okay, what else? The elbow's been sore. The shoulder's been sore. And then when you start dissecting the program to how the individual moves, then you realize, wait a second, this person has no external rotation in their right arm, yet they're going overhead. Wait a second, this person has no thoracic extension in their spine. And that with this is allowing them to have to do this, arch the lower back, and that's causing some shearing on that lumbar spine. This is why, you know, there is, that's what I really pay close attention to. And I'll have a group, I'll have a thousand people in a group and I'm calling audibles with them or 500 people in a group. I'm like, no, oh, Don, I just had this issue. Oh, great, listen, instead of the, um, instead of this form of squat, we're gonna go with more of a box squat, here's how. And to give that type of attention to them really gives them this one-on-one -on -one attention um, at a very at a very low cost. So in terms of, I'm glad we covered that because I do think there are so many misconceptions around the body parts and frequency and so forth. But I, but I love this idea of I got two to three days a week and I've got 20 to 30 minutes and let and let's run with that for the for this episode. So if I've got two to three days a week and I've got 20 to 30 minutes, because look, the, the biggest obstacle for people who are motivated and educated and 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 want to be fit is time. You know, kids work life shit happens. And so with that said, let's maybe start what I think is also interesting with time. If, if, if you have to commute, that's an obstacle. Then there's at home and, and if maybe you have equipment, maybe you don't have equipment. So let's start if I, with people who don't have equipment. If you're at home and you've got you and you and your body weight, what can, what can be reasonably done? You know, yeah. I'm guessing sit-ups, push-ups, yeah. maybe chin-ups, yeah. squats. So what, what can be done? What does that look like? Yeah, I, I would focus more on a, a squat, a hinge, a push, a pull, and a direct core movement. So squat could be a body weight squat, could be a split squat, could be a rear foot elevated split squat. Air squat, is, is, is that, is that the, the proper term? That's a, that's a body weight squat. So yeah, so we can, we can do that. I would even in that squat category, I would put the lunge as an option. Walking lunge, seesaw lunge, reverse lunge. So getting that knee dominant, a little bit more of that knee dominant movement in first, that would be my first plug. My second would be a hinge. So I'd probably work on like a body weight, one-legged RDL, which would technically be called an inverted hamstring. So what is, what is that? Walk us through what that looks like. I think everyone knows what a squat is, but walk, walk us through what that looks like. An inverted hamstring would be here to here. See what I just did for balance? We can take it up a notch now. We can go from here to where I open the hip and I close the hip. And the amount of balance and stability that that's forcing me to create is high. The amount of engagement is high. You're going to feel your heart rate elevate. You're going to be in a way, flossing the body a bit. You're going to hear some cracks going on. We're really allowing the body to move in a fashion that's meant to move. We'll work on a little bit of internal external rotation with, um, with that hip airplane. But again, who are we starting with? If it's a beginner, I would say, you know what? Let's start with the body weight squat. Which that wasn't low enough. Body weight squat. And I would say, let's go right to that hinge. Next, an upper push. A push-up. We could do a push-up on the floor. We could do a push-up on our desk. We could do a push-up on our fridge. We could do a push-up on our wall. 
all depends on your level of, of, of how advanced you are. If you're just getting started and you, you know, feel like you have no strength and you just don't feel confident, that's great. So we started with the knee, the hip, the push. Now we need something to retract and work that posterior chain. So I'd say something like a TYL and W is really simple. We're body weight or we can grab water bottles and just go into a standing E, a standing Y, a standing L, and a standing W. Really simple. You need no equipment for that. Try doing 10, 10, 10, and 10 in those four movement of those four sets I just showed you with no weight. You're going to feel a burn in your shoulders, and your shoulders are going to feel retracted. You're going to feel a bit taller. And then lastly, there are so many things we can do for our core. We can do a plank. We could do a side plank. We could do a Copenhagen plank. We could do a side plank elbow to knee. We could do shoulder taps. There's so many options. I mean, right there, I can, I have, you know, body weight programs on, online, express ones that are under 30 minutes where people can just get in and out. There's no excuse. I mean, at the very least, you get moving around circuit style with these exercises. I've made some body weight workouts that are 45 minutes. I've won called the moment of truth that I ran. Um, I, I, I took 70 people with me. I rented an island in Mexico this year off, um, off of Puerto Vallarta. And they were from about 15 different countries. So we had about 70 people came in. I ran a, a, a one-week retreat and every single day. We started with two groups of 35 and um, body weight workouts. I love it. So, so I, I encourage everyone to head over to donsaladino.com because you mentioned you've got tremendous resources and programs for everyone. But for everyone listening, I'm going to say go to, go to YouTube because we're going to put this on YouTube. And just so, so everyone heads over there now, if you could just briefly again walk through the workout, if you could just show us again from the side the, the, the squats, the just everything you did again just all at once so we camera it. So perfect. That, that's a great air wow. squat. And you know, guys, take – Whatever your level is, it could be between five reps. It could be, be between 15, 20 reps. The rep ranges as we get those reps up, we're going to be working a little bit more muscular endurance. We're going to be practicing those movements. So I think if it's body weight, you know, do it to where you feel a level of tension. But, you know, I think going to that body weight squat, if we just started with 10, I think going with that inverted hamstring where every time we're standing up, 10 each leg, right, each leg, 10 push-ups, Going through three sets of the T, the Y, the L, and the W, you do three sets of 10 of each. So that's like 120 reps, right? And then um, choosing a core exercise, going into like, let's just say a side plank because, you know, we hit the push-up face down. Now we're in that prone position where a push-up is a moving plank. The push-up is probably one of the most misunderstood exercises that I see performed incorrectly. I can almost take 90% of the people at gyms and just look at their push up and just say, it's just not where it needs to be. There's so much arching in the lower back. There's not, your glutes should be tight. Your lats should be tight. You should be trying to create tension in the body as you're moving. You should be envisioning that a tornado is blowing over your body as you're going through that push up and your body's not moving, you're creating this level of stability. So when you go into these exercises and you start focusing on them, you could take something as simple as body weight training and add a lot of value to it. So can you show us briefly, what does the proper form of a push up look like? Cause hearing you talk, I'm like, I know how to do push ups, but I'm thinking, Oh wow, I'm doing it wrong too. Sure. So let's take it to the floor. Now, everything I'm showing you on the floor right now can be done on a desk, on a wall, on a couch, on a fridge. I don't care. All right. But the first thing with the push-up, the push-up is a moving plank. So we want to set the push-up where we're not going into extension in our lower back, which I see most people doing. So see what I'm doing here? This is incorrect. Because we're, we're, we're shearing. We're really causing some compression in that lumbar spine. So I need those hips up a little bit. And I'm going to tighten my glutes as hard as I can. My glutes right now are squeezed. Then what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take each hand and I'm trying to rotate the right hand out and the left hand out. Now, what am I doing? I'm creating tension in my lats. So between squeezing my legs, my glutes, and flexing and tensing my lats, we're doing something right now. We're creating tension. These are called tension techniques. So every one of you who wants to get into a plank position and you brag about, oh, I can hold a plank for five minutes, it's nonsense. How much tension can you create in the plank for 10 to 20 seconds? You should be in that plank position, trying to rip the floor apart, 
trying to squeeze your glutes, trying to squeeze your lats. This is how you create tension. This is how you can change um, your body composition and your strength level without adding any type of external resistance. So recap it. I'm trying to literally turn my right hand clockwise. I'm trying to turn my left hand counterclockwise. I'm creating tension in my glutes, my lats, and then I'm down and I raise up in one piece. Where a lot of us will drop down and we'll push our upper body up. When you see how my lower body just hung out? That's incorrect. I need everything. It's a push up, it's a moving plank. We're creating tension. It's down and up. So I feel like I'm pushing through my chest, my shoulders, my triceps, my lats, my glutes, my legs are creating tension. When you train the entire body as a whole like this, trust me, for those of you worried about getting a muscle bigger, you're not going to because we're not training one muscle. We're training the whole entire body as a unit, which is, gonna, which is really going to help create you know, a firm, um, lean-looking physique, in my opinion, if it's coupled with proper nutrition. And on that note too, what, what I love what you just did, you know, you're talking about the core and abs, essentially you, you nail plank, you nail the push up, vice versa, and just focus on that. We don't need a lot. My, when I write programs in the beginning, they're a little bit underwhelming, right? Like I, I always, and that's why I won't take on one-on-one -on -one clients. I don't, I don't train people anymore. Um, I work with my community. I work with Blake Lively, Annie Hathaway. Ryan Reynolds and Sebastian Stan are really the four people that I'll work with when they need me now. But I do not, like, I'm not in the job of trying to hand you a program that you're going to look at and say, oh, this is impressive. I'm going to hand you the program that's going to get you in the best shape possible. And when someone looks at a program and goes, this looks too easy, that is the worst response you can give me because there is no such thing as an easy program. Okay. I can give you, I can assign to someone right now three exercises, bring them into the gym. And in time, they will earn the right to push themselves to the point where they're going, oh my God, I cannot do anything else. But if you're sitting there taking three exercises and just running through the motions and you're like, this is easy, it's because you're rushing to get from one to 10 or one to 15. That's why I don't care about reps. I do believe that different rep ranges are going to focus on you know, different types of like, you know, call it energy systems, different rep ranges could produce a different outcome, whether it's strength and power going lower, whether it's your hypertrophy rep range, whether it's more of your muscular endurance, could, which could be 15 and above. But that doesn't mean you're not producing hypertrophy when you do 25 reps or strength when you do 25 reps. We're still touching into these things. There's just specific rep ranges will, I think, really create an optimal response if you go in there and you train them for a period of time. But I also understand that we need to move away from that. Like if it's a woman just coming to me and she's like, I just do 20 all the time. I'm like, all right, well, what about getting really strong at eights in time? Like if we get your eights really strong, we could put some more muscle on you. And by putting some more muscle on you, we'll be able to drop some body fat, maybe even getting your body weight to change a bit. But, you know, we suddenly start hearing the word strength. We suddenly start hearing the words muscle. And um, all I can say is if you've been taking a specific approach to this, and it hasn't been working, then it's just wrong. And, and hear me out when, I, when I'm saying that. And I, I get this all the time. Oh, Don, I, I went and jumped on this diet. I said, well, how did that work for you? It worked great. I lost 20 pounds. I'm like, wait a second. You just told me you put 20 back on. Oh, yeah, I ended up putting it back on. I said, well, then it didn't work. So if you do something and it works for a period of time and then you put it back on, unless it's due to like an injury or like a family death or something that just it's obstruct and you stop training if you were continuing to do that and you lost motivation in my opinion it doesn't work this needs to be a holistic approach this needs to be a lifestyle change this is not about coming in with a rocky type mentality this is not about going 110 percent every day that's nonsense all right like you're going to be tired we have kids i have two kids a 15 and 14 year old i had my daughter at a concert last night i didn't get home till one in the morning you think i felt great this morning when i was training no i i did it like we do the best that we can but you got to call audible for training and you got to recognize when something's not working i love that because life happens and what i what i love and and i love our focus today specifically on what we can do with our body weight is because Many times we just don't have the time to get to the gym or whatever it is, and we got to work with what we have. And you've got your body. And I also think it's really important to emphasize: it's not okay. Here are you three sets of ten. Maybe that goes up. Maybe that goes down. But it's really focusing on the quality of that rep and getting the form right. You know. And one thing I found is 
as you get stronger, maybe you go a little slower. Maybe you focus even more so on form. You don't necessarily, it's not a contest to just, you know, this is, I would see this at that, that gym in Glencove I went to, you know, 30 years ago all the time, you know, jamming out reps, like trying to get the bench press up and the guy's moving on the, you know, his back is going up. He's, you know, it looks like he's going to fall over and, uh, you know, <laughs> throw his back out. So consistency trumps intensity. We fitness professionals are discouraging people. Rocky, one of my all time favorite movies, I also think sets one of the worst examples. Because all, seriously, people look at, well, that's hard work. I'm like, yeah, but it's also showing people that that's the only way that he does it to be successful. It's that training montage, it's him climbing up the mountain, collapsing. We don't need it. We don't need it. I had one a great story, and I think a lot of your listeners are going to be able to relate to this in a in a positive way. Is um, I I had someone come to me years ago, and they said, "Don, um, I have a request." I go, "What?" I go, "I want to see my top two abs." And I looked at this person. I started laughing. I was like, "What is this top two abs?" I was like, "What are you talking about?" I've never heard anyone say that. I want to see my top two abs. I'm 40 years old. Um, I'm 45 year, years old. I got a family. I don't have a lot of time. I like training. I'm just, I'm not going to go eat the way that you eat. I'm just not, I enjoy it. He's not going to enjoy it. So how do I said, all right, listen, you hold, you hold a good amount of muscle. Let's take a look at your nutrition plan. And I looked at it. It wasn't terrible, but there was a lot of, uh, leaks. Let's just call it leaks where I, I use that term. It's leaking, meaning like throughout the day, oh, I pick on my kids, chicken fingers, I'm just taking one taste of a dessert. It's no big deal. I had a cocktail on Tuesday, which is fine. You know, I can have one drink, but I also had another two on this day and another two on this day. And I started looking at everything and I started uh, uh, assessing the accumulation of wasted calories throughout the week. So I turned to this person. I said, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're just going to cut it in half. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, no, we're going to just cut it in half. We're eliminating the majority of the desserts. We'll allow you on this time. We're eliminating the majority of the alcohol, but you can still get it in during the week. And there's a couple of things with your eating I don't like here with white flour and certain things that you just don't need to get in, which I think is causing a lot of gut inflammation. I think it's also contributing to why your back's always feeling a little off and we're assessing that through training. And you know, I swear to God, three weeks later, this person came back in and took their shirt off and you could see their top two abs. And he looked at me and he was like, oh my God, that wasn't that hard. I go, you're right. He goes, actually, that wasn't hard at all. What's next? And right when he said that, I smiled because that's what it's about. Every single person right now, they're trying to find the A program when unfortunately they're just not ready for it. A major league ball player comes back in February to pitching, to pitching camp. He's not throwing 100 miles an hour. He's got to ease into it in time. A lot of you out there who are struggling to find that level of consistency, you're not taking a minimalistic approach. Take a minimalistic approach. Get in there. You know what? If you hate training past 22 minutes, then make sure you find a program that's 20 minutes long. If you hate a program that's that, – if at 20 minutes you lose focus, find something that's 17 minutes. Find a minimalistic approach where you can allow yourself to be successful, develop some consistency, See if you start making some better decisions, some better choices. And then you know what? Proof's in the pudding because this becomes really easy. It really does. Like this is really easy for me and the people I work with because they see progress. But the problem is you jump into it. You try and get rid of everything that you love. No drinking, no desserts. I'm not going to go out for a month. Sober October. And then you turn around and you're miserable. And you're like, all right, well, and then you go back to what you were doing and you put all that weight back on. And at that point, you're like, oh, well, I'll just, it's November now, it's Thanksgiving. I'm just going to wait till Christmas. I'm going to wait till New Year's. And by the time New Year's rolls around, you put 10 pounds on and then you're pulling yourself out of the hole. So guys, this isn't 80% training, uh, 80% nutrition, 20% training, 7% supplementation. This is 100% mental because there's so many ways that we can approach this that can work. And and that's what I like doing. I like really diving in the heads of people and showing them, all right, listen, what do we have to do to get you from point A to point B uh, successfully? Well, I agree. It's a lifestyle and you got to cut out the crap in your diet, but you have to do it in a way that you can maintain. Otherwise, to your point, you'll just, you'll just ditch it and you'll be back to square one. And so with, with that said, assu assuming we've done that, everything, all, all the scientific literature and many of the experts, you know, point to something that is non-negotiable if you want to maintain and build muscle mass, and that is protein consumption. And so let's 
I, I know you got to run run in a minute, but let, let, let's talk about protein consumption in terms of how do you think of when do we need to consume protein after a workout to build and maintain? How much? How often? And, and what kind? Because this is a tough one. When I look at the numbers for for me, for example, I'm 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 six seven. I'm two hundred pounds. So if I, if I'm going by the literature, I got to have a a gram of protein per pound. I'm 200 pounds, but I'm 6'7". I'm not like if I'm 5'10", 200, that's maybe a different story, but 6'7", 200. And I eat, I eat, I eat meat, but not much. I try to eat plant-based. Me getting 200 grams of protein is, is, is really a challenge. So just how, without getting into me, how do you think about protein and best practices post-workout and throughout the day and week? Well, I mean, listen, I like the gram of protein per pound approach for someone who is active and who is resistance training or an athlete, et cetera. Uh, but we don't need that to survive, right? Which is why there's so many conflicting um, approaches. Now, you really have three macronutrients. You have your three main macronutrients, protein, which is, you know, four calories per gram. You have your carbs, which is four calories per gram. And you have your, and your gram of fat is nine calories. So if we need to get to maintenance level of calories, maintenance level, um, which I believe most people should be at, we're going to have to consume a certain amount of each macronutrient to equal that, you know, that total level of calories. So people don't understand what I'm saying. Well, if one gram of fat is nine calories and one gram of protein is four and one gram of carbs is four, that's eight plus, uh, that's four plus four plus nine is 17 calories. You just equaled 17 calories. So when you start, someone the other day I'm talking to was like, I have to, I have to raise my calories 400 grams. I was like, well, that's easy. He goes, well, what do you mean? It's, it's not easy. What do I do? I go, well, that's 25 grams of protein, 25 grams of carbs, and um, 10 um, roughly uh, 20 grams of fat. So 25 carbs is 100. Uh, 25 carbs is 100 grams. 25 protein is 100 grams. You're at 200. We need another 200. And if I go 20 grams of fat, that's 180. So we're at 380, close enough in my in my opinion. So um, I, I, there's so much conflicting information because if you're you you said you're plant based, are you plant based or plant strong? There's 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 a difference. I try to eat mostly vegetables. I do I do eat meat. I don't eat a lot of red meat. I I love you know I'll have I'll have my salmon. I'll have my sardines. I'll do. But for for me. I have a history of cardiovascular issues. If I start to eat too much meat, not good for me. So like, and I think a lot of people lean probably 60 to 80%, you know, vegetarian. I think it's more, I think most people are Mediterranean. Yeah, I'd say more, more, more like a Mediterranean diet. Yeah, Mediterranean diet's one of my favorite ways of eating. I, I never like categorizing eating because people sure. like how to eat. I'm like, it's called a clean eating diet, but it's called healthy whole foods. But you eat plants strong, which I love. It's 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 still getting in, you're getting a lot of plants while recognizing that there's lean, clean sources of protein that I'm going to consume. And I think carbohydrates are – carbs are going to come back in the next few years. You're going to hear it. Like fats came back after the 80s when people were on a snack well crap and then suddenly healthy fats came back. You're going to see carbs come back because carbs is one of your main sources of energy. When people say I cut carbs, I'm like, no, cut bad carbs. Just make sure your fibrous carbs, you know, if it's uh, – Brown rice is my favorite sweet potato or like a gluten-free oats. Those are carbs that we need for energy. Uh, but yeah, I think that it's simple math. If you're 200 pounds and people ask, well, how many times a day do I need to eat? I'm like, well, it's math. If you're 200 pounds, we got to look at, well, how are we going to get the amount of protein to hit 200 grams? And the first thing that I think to in, 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 in my head is five meals, 40 grams a meal. If you go five meals a day at 40 grams a meal, you're at 200 doesn't seem too hard now, right? Like it's math. Like when, when you're trying to accumulate a certain amount of fat, a certain amount of carbohydrates, it's just determined how many meals can I do that in? I'm like, well, where do our macronutrients need to be? Are you trying to put muscle on? Because then I would never recommend any type of fasting. I would never recommend any type of ketogenic diet. Like I'm not saying there's not a place for this stuff, but we have to know what we're eating for. Like if someone's fasting to rebound from a poor night of eating, I think that's the worst approach because organic nutrition Foods that are abundant in micronutrients, like that are that are healthy foods, that's what's going to detoxify our body. Not drinking some crappy, you, you know, um, you know, homemade junky cleanse that you, you know has terrible ingredients in it just because someone's trying to sell it. Not saying clean cleanses are bad. I'm just I'm saying some of them might be. But um, yeah, I think living in that one gram per pound of body weight, I think that's something that is um very good for muscle building, 
It's a great place to start. And then we basically can add or subtract on those three macronutrients that I listed according to whether we need to go up with our calories or go down. And in terms of consuming protein post-workout, do you believe in that? You know, I got a window of an hour or a half hour, or is it really that day? There's no, the, that, that window is nonsense. That window of 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, nonsense. There is no research. It's an umbrella policy. It is why I tell people to eat post-workout, like why do I eat immediately after workout, is because that is an opportunity for me to consume macronutrients to help not only maintain my blood sugar levels, but to help me hit my number for the day. So if it's 200 grams of protein and I'm not eating for an hour to two hours after a workout, well, man, that was an opportunity that I just lost that I should be working towards that total number of calories I need for the day. So that's how we need to look at it. Now, if we're not eating post-workout, what I get worried about is that blood sugar levels are off. If we become famished, starving, then we're going to go in and we're going to make poor decisions, right? Also, post-workout, blood sugar levels are low, glycogen levels are low, great time to replenish carbohydrates. So if it's someone that is trying to get leaner, I might look at that as an opportunity for me to get a higher level of carbs in post-workout because it's going to be um, absorbed more rapidly. And I know you got to run. This is my last question, I promise. In terms of protein sources, if you had to list like, you know, your, your, your top three animal sources, your top three plant sources. Um, animal sources, is, is it's pretty easy for me. I mean, excluding all the organ meats, which just aren't my thing, and I understand the value of organ meats, how nutrient dense they are. I don't like them. So um, for me, it's, again, finding the highest quality source. I love eggs. I love wild salmon, right? I love um, grass-fed beef, right? I love, um, yeah, chicken. I mean, I, I start, like, I'll eat chicken if it's from a high source. And you get people, oh, it's just polluted and this and that. Guys, this is nonsense, man. Like, you know what? It, it, it's like we're, we're also kind of looking for love in all the wrong places here. People want to nitpick. No, seriously, they, they want to nitpick something that is so minuscule that will probably have no effect on your life, yet this is the cert- same person who goes out and binge drinks once a week. Like, okay, like, let's, 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 well, you don't want to stop that now, right? Like, you're not knocking that, but you want to go gluten-free. You want to go gluten-free, but you're out at night, you know, having three, four drinks, which is technically binge drinking. Oh, but like, a glass is healthy, is it? No, it's not healthy. Like, alcohol is alcohol. Someone asked me, what do I drink? When I decide to drink, I'll drink anything. It, it, it doesn't, I don't care if it has high calorie. I don't care if it's low calorie. I don't care about the clear. Alcohol is a toxin. It is going to affect sleep quality. It's going to a, a affect the way our hormones respond and repair and heal. It's going to affect the way that we sleep, which if that goes to crap, yes, aging, the aging response will visual visibility visibly get sped up. You know, our hormone levels will get thrown off. Our cortisol levels will get thrown off. We're looking for love in all the wrong places. So from an animal source standpoint, great. I like that. I'll even supplement some high quality grass-fed protein powder once in a while if I need it. I had it today. From a plant standpoint, it's tough because the amount of rice and beans and nuts you have to consume to get that protein up, which is your muscle building block, is so great that you're also consuming so many carbs and so many fats that your body's just not utilizing. It's tough for people who are plant-based, not plant strong, you're plant strong, who are strictly plants to just, you know, to improve body composition. I'm not saying it can't be done. It's very difficult. So I would say that supplementing with a high quality plant protein powder is an absolute must. It is a necessity for someone on a, a, on a plant-based diet. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, I, I know you got to run and everyone, please head over to YouTube and head over to donsaladino.com. Uh, Don, we, we definitely have to have you back. There's a lot a lot more to unpack with you. This is fun for, for me. I enjoy it. I'm crazy busy, but I'll get on with you anytime. My best to everyone, guys. Thank you.